Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, give me give a big old thumbs up. Hi, everybody. Can you hear We are on. Hola, 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 como estas? Muy bien. Y tu que tal? Hola, 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 como estas? Muy bien. Como vas? Hola, hola, como estas? Muy bien, y tu que tal? Ba, ba, ba. All the native Spanish speakers, I apologize if I just ruined the language with that song, but the energy is there. So I'm just trying to get us going because apparently if I pay, play background music, YouTube flags my YouTube channel. So I got to create my own music. Not the best, I know. Annoying YouTube and their rules. So today we're doing vocabulary. Okay, so vocabulary. Vocab is very important. So I'd like you guys to write down five words you memorized this morning. That can be any five words. If you haven't done that, you should memorize five words every morning. Five words every morning. You could pick any words you want. You write them down in the evening, and then in the morning you wake up before you do anything else, and you memorize five words. The first thing you do every morning does not need to be check your cell phone. How many of you guys check your phone the moment you wake up? If you check your phone the first thing you do when you wake up, maybe it's time to disconnect and put that phone like in the other room. It's like you know you're addicted to social media when the first thing you do is you wake up. You're like, oh my God, a puppy playing with a rabbit. I have to look at that and like that. Amazing. Okay, so memorize five words every morning. If you memorize those five words every morning, you guys will notice you accomplish a lot because the day gets away from you. You start having to deal with the kids and work or whatever else you got going on. Before you know it, it's 11 o'clock at night. So first thing you do, it's really about consistency. Passing this exam is really about consistency. It's not saying I'm going to spend all day on Thursday studying. I promise. It's a little bit every day. Okay, you got it. so guys, make a promise. Everybody write, I promise I'll check my words. I'll learn my vocabulary before I check cute puppy photos or whatever the good looking people are doing on vacation. All those annoying like supermodels on vacations. I hate them. And yes, it's because I'm jealous and I can own that fact. I want to have chiseled abs and live on a beautiful beach somewhere. And just be like, wee, with some camera taking pictures of me from the sky. Okay, if you could do 20 questions vocab every day, that's even better. But, you know. So let's get going. Let's do some vocab. Eminent domain is the first word on the board. What do you guys know about eminent domains? Let's do some vocab. We're going to bust through a bunch of vocabulary today. Okay, so what is eminent domain. So eminent domain is the government's right to take property for public use. What action do they do when they take the property? What's that called? Hmm, what's that word? that eminent, under eminent domain, they use, take the property. So eminent domain is the noun, so what would be the verb? What would be the verb for when they take the property? Condemnation, nice job, Carlos. Carlos Leva, first one on the board of that, nice job, Carlos. Condemnation, if you don't know what that means, just think of when something's condemned. When a property's condemned, you can't use it anymore. Everybody got that? So that's condemnation. And if they don't give you just compensation and you want to sue the government, what's that called? What's that called? So what's that called when just compensation is not given, you sue the government? Nice job, like us so, inverse condemnation. That would be called inverse condemnation. All right, inverse condemnation. Now, eminent domain is a government power. What are the other government powers? 
What are the other government powers? What do you guys think? What are the other government powers? Okay, I see police power. Good. There's eminent domain, taxation, and it's cheat. A lot of you guys are writing Pete. Pete will not be on your exam, just so you guys know. How many of you guys memorize all these acronyms? Government powers. Uh, Pete. Uh, fixture. Maria. Uh, join in. To tip. What does it mean? Oh, no. I just know there's something about Maria to tip and Pete and Tizida and Stud and I don't know. Just a lot of weird words I got to remember. All right. So, guys, sometimes, and tell me if you're guilty of this. Sometimes people get so caught up in the memory techniques that actually just memorizing the thing isn't that hard. Sometimes you guys don't need cute little memory techniques. I know they're fun and they're great. And when concerts are difficult, sure. But don't get caught up in always trying to memorize cute things. For example, if I say how big is an acre? How big is an acre? What do you guys think? How big is an acre? 43,560 square feet. And some of you guys get so caught up with, a, uh, four plus three, seven, five, seven, zero is 11, seven, 11, or, or switch the verse two, three, four, five, six, zero. Uh, how about you just remember 43,560 square feet? How about that? Right? You guys get my point. Somebody asked, what is stud? Stud is the essential elements of value, scarcity, transferability, utility, and demand. But getting back to this government power thing, okay? So we got Pete, police power, eminent domain, taxation, and it's cheap. Uh, somebody just wrote four old man driving, 35 on a See, I just think it's easy to remember 40,560 square feet. Am I the only one on that? Maybe you guys agree. Okay, so you have police power and eminent domain, taxation, and it's cheap. Police power and eminent domain are the big doozies that come up with the government power. The other two are a little simpler, okay? What is the big difference between police power and eminent domain? What is the difference between police power and eminent domain? What is the difference between police power and eminent domain? Nice job, Melissa Takas. Big high five for you. Money. Money is the big difference. See, in eminent domain, we said just compensation must be paid. Police power tells you how to use the property, but they don't take it away from you. Therefore, no money is exchanged. Everybody got that? That's the important point. And what I want you guys to do is understand these concepts more than just memorize them. Because if you just memorize them, if it doesn't show up exactly as you memorize them on your exam, you could be in trouble. But if you understand the concept, a little deviation from what you memorize is not going to hurt you if you understand the gist of it. Everybody got it, right? I got it. So police power, just compensation is not paid. They tell you how to use it. Okay, everybody got that? So I want everybody to write that down if you can. Eminent domain, they give you money. Police power, there's no money involved. Okay. Give me examples of police power as you learn for the real estate exam, as it pertains to the real estate exam. Give me examples of police power as it pertains to the real estate exam. EB Cakes says her husband's taking the exam. Good luck, EB. I'll be like Obi-Wan Kenobi on his shoulder giving him the answers. Okay, so zoning, building codes, rent control. These are all examples of police power. Okay. These are all examples of police power, building codes, rent control, um, zoning. Give me an example of a building code that you see right now where you are sitting, whether it's in your office or whatever. Give me an example of a building code in the room you are sitting in right now. 
So Karen Rivas, taxation would not be under the police powers. Fire alarm, good. Handicap ramp, electrical board, rails on the steps, good. Excellent. Hurricane windows, all examples of building codes, good. Give me examples of different zoning regulations. Give me an example of different zoning regulations. Give me an example of zoning regulations. Residential, commercial, so R3 would be multifamily residential. Everybody write that down. R3, multifamily residential. Good, so that's the example. Here's a tougher question. Everybody ready for a tougher question? Say, I'm ready, Joe, right? I'm ready for a tougher question. Bring it, bring it. Bring the noise. Do, 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 do. Okay. If your property is zoned one way, or if you're going to buy a property zoned one way, and you want permission to conduct activity that's an exception to the rule, what's that called? You want permission to conduct activity like maybe build a unit that's not right or, or it's not there or a certain distance. A variance. Nice job. Everybody give yourself a high five for if you wrote variance. Variance is an exception to the rule that's granted to you that will not affect the rest of the community. Double or nothing. Your property is zoned one way. And then years later... They change the zoning rules that con contradict the way you are using your property. But you do not have to change what you are doing. What is that called? So you have your property. Then years later, they zone it in a way that contradicts the way you're using your property. But you don't have to change. That is called a grandfather clause. A grandfather clause. Nice job, everybody. Feel like we got a good flow? We're all doing well here? Look how much we're going over just from this one word on the board. We haven't even changed the slide yet. And we've already gone over like eight different concepts. You guys are doing great. And what I'm trying to demonstrate by doing this is that these concepts are not isolated. If you could link these concepts together, you'll understand everything a lot more. Everybody got that? So if you kind of flow with it, you'll understand it a lot more. Okay, so that's a grandfather clause. Good. And what you'd have is called non-conforming use. So if you have a grandfather clause... That grandfather clause be allowing you to conduct yourself in a manner that would be considered non-conforming use. Okay? Everybody got that? All right. Good job, everybody. The other two government powers, you have police power, eminent domain, taxation. Is taxation a specific lien or a general lien? A specific lien? or general lien? Thanks, Cherry. If you guys think I'm doing a good job, um, I would love if you guys could hit the like button, the thumbs up on the bottom. A little positive feedback always feels good. I am human. I don't mind a high five or a pat on the back every once in a while. I'm no different. Okay. So when I asked you, is tax a specific lien or a general lien? The answer is, it depends. Nice job, Ashley Neal. It depends. It depends. Good. The reason is because, everybody write this down. This is important. A lot of people make this mistake, okay? Property tax is a specific lien. Income tax is a general lien. Everybody got that? So be careful what they ask you about on your exam or in life for that matter. So income tax, I see April wrote IRS, good. That's a general lien. 
property tax is a specific lien. So what does that mean? So what is a specific lien? So I'm using these words. Tell me what it means. So what is a specific lien? What do you guys think? What's a specific lien? What do you guys think is a specific lien? So a specific lien means if you don't pay, they can only take one thing, like your house. Okay, so if you don't pay your property tax, take your house. They can't start debiting your bank account or taking your car, things of that nature. A general lien, if you don't pay, they could take everything. So when you go to court and you lose a case, such as a case on your child support, so that would be a judgment lien, okay? If you lose a court case and you have a judgment lien, that is what they call a general involuntary lien, which means they can take everything, whether you like it or not. Everybody got it, right? Got it, Joe. The last part of the government power is as cheat. What does as cheat mean? What is as cheat? What is as cheat? It means no heirs, no debt, no will. It means the government takes it over. The government takes over the property. What's that called when you die without a will? So if you have no heirs, no will, you're basically Ebenezer Scrooge. Please tell me you guys know who Ebenezer Scrooge is. All you guys who don't really need to celebrate Christmas with me because like Ebenezer Scrooge is like, anyway, another time. Okay, that's called intestate when you die without a will. What's it called when you die with a will? Intestate, no will, with a will is called testate. Watch, now the only thing you guys are gonna remember from this webinar is Ebenezer Scrooge. I don't know why, but I need to watch A Christmas Carol tonight. Okay, that's called test date. Okay, so that's called test state. Okay, here's another question. Everybody ready? What's a, a handwritten will called? What's a handwritten will called? Holographic will. You guys have been studying. You guys have been studying. Quickly write down so we all kind of gauge. Some people are going to feel guilty. Some people are not. How much time do you study every day? How many minutes, hours, or some of you seconds do you study every day for this exam? People always ask me, how much should I study every day? I hate that question because I don't know you. I don't know how much you, you got to spend to learn something or memorize something or do, you know, everybody's different. Okay, so I'm seeing like two hours, three hours, seven hours. It's a lot. I guess it depends how far in advance you're doing this. My only advice is don't cram. A lot of you guys like these weekend crash courses, which is fine. But understand those courses are meant to review what you learned. It's not meant to learn from scratch, those crash courses. Does everybody got that? Unless you have some photographic memory, because it is boring talking about this stuff for two days straight or one day straight, whatever the crash course is that you decide to attend. It is super boring. 
So even if they just straight up give you the answers, it's hard to sit there and let it sink in. Those are meant to review, not learn it from scratch. Kennedy says, I'm pregnant, so I can only take so much. So your kid's going to come out with a real estate license. Because all he's going to hear while he's in the womb is like, a freehold estate is undefined in duration. Okay. If you guys can't sleep at night or if your baby's kicking and he can't sleep, just start reading him some real estate law from your course and he'll be out in two seconds. And you guys find that? They're like, ooh, I can't sleep. I'm so awake. Oh, eminent domain and real pro. Oh, I'm so tired. So if you want to sleep on a plane, just bring your textbook. You'll be out like in one minute. Okay. All right, a valid contract. A valid contract. I'm not going to lie to you guys and tell you guys this stuff is exciting. It's not. It's just a means to an end. And I want to help you get through that means in the best way possible so you can move on to what you love to do. There's people who are like, oh, I love this. It's so interesting. It's like, whatever, Rainbow Bright. You know, keep your sunshine to yourself. We're trying to get this done. All right, valid contract. A valid contract has four essentials. Right? Don't you hate those people like, oh, I just love studying what a freehold estate is. It's like, ugh. Lame geek. Okay, so valid contract has the four essentials of offer and acceptance. Consideration, cable parties, and lawful object. Good. So offered acceptance is also considered mutual consent, meeting of the minds, agreement. It all means the same thing. So you have the agreement. You have consideration. You have cable parties. And you have lawful object. When is agreement considered agreement? What do you guys think? When is agreement considered agreement? Congratulations, Eva. She just bought me Starbucks. You're the best. Thank you. Okay, so it's a three-step process. It's a three-step process. Beanie. Nerkisisian got it right. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I want to acknowledge you because you got it right. Offer acceptance and communicate back the acceptance. People forget that third part. Everybody got that? You have to communicate back the acceptance. All right, everybody understand that? You need to communicate back the acceptance. Offer acceptance and communicate back the acceptance. All right. Because if you if I make an offer and you accept it, but I don't know you accepted it, I'm going to go and make an offer somewhere else. Makes sense, right? You got to let me know you accepted it for that to be completed. So you have the mutual consent. The next up, you have cable parties, lawful object, and consideration. Does consideration have to be money? Does consideration have to be money? No, it could be a hug. Consideration be a hug? What do you guys think? Can it be a hug? Can it be a high five? Can it be like a salsa dance? A little secret for you guys. I'm an excellent salsa dancer. 
I know you wouldn't believe it, but it's true. Okay, so that's what you need. Does a contract need to be in writing? Does a contract need to be in writing? Does a contract need to be in writing? No. It's on the board, guys. It's like right there on the board. It does not need to be in writing. So then why so often when people say, I get a question of a contract doesn't need to be in writing, they say yes. Why? Why do people always get that wrong? Why do people always get that wrong that contracts need to be in writing? Because here's why. Because you're studying for your real estate exam. And when ownership of real estate is transferred, it needs to be in writing. That's why. So everybody got it? When ownership of real estate is transferred, it needs to be in writing. The way they trick you, everybody listening, right? I'm listening, Joe. Put your ear to the microphone on this one, all right? The way they trick you, drum roll please, I'm gonna give you a drum roll, is they'll ask you about a lease under a year. And they'll be like, oh, a lease. Well, I, I, I learned that contracts need to be in writing. And that's, real, that's not really real estate, okay? That's not ownership. You're letting somebody use it, but it's not ownership. Everybody got that? Okay, when I say needs to be in writing for real estate, we're talking about transferring the ownership, transferring title. A lease under a year is not transferring ownership. Everybody got that? So that's when they trick you on. So not all contracts need to be in writing. You have oral contracts, you have implied contracts, but people make a mistake on this one because they're thinking about real estate and when you transfer title, that's ownership, that needs to be in writing. Everybody got it? So I really want to clarify that because a lot of people need to get that wrong. Excuse me, a lot of people get that wrong. Signatures is a form of writing. Some of you will ask me about signatures. That's writing. Okay? Everybody got that? So that's an important difference. So we're talking about contracts being in writing. Okay? Be careful of what they're asking about. So I'll say it again. When they ask you about contracts in writing, and this is one people trip up on a lot, be very aware of what they're asking about. Okay? If they're asking about the transfer of title, if they're asking about a lease, or if they're just saying contracts in general, the answers can be different. Everybody got it? Is that a good tip? Hopefully that's a good tip that can help you guys pass your real estate exam. What is a commercial acre? What is a commercial acre? What is a commercial acre? Nice job, Ginny Roa. Acre minus the building, sidewalks, and all that other kind of fun stuff. So you have an acre that's 43,560 square feet that we learned before, right guys? So commercial acre is the part of the acre minus the land you can't build on. Things like roads, setbacks, it's the unusable area. Like you can't build your house on the road. Does everybody get that? So you look at an acre, you're looking at a big piece of land, okay? But in that piece of land, there may be sidewalks, roads, and, and even if you buy that area, you can't build on that public road. Everybody got that? So the commercial acre is the acre minus things like curbs and sidewalks and roads. If you never heard of that before, don't worry. Super simple concept. All right, so don't be intimidated by it. It's just an acre minus the part 
that you can't build on. Okay, so if you've never heard that before, no big deal. Not, it's not a complicated thing, so you'll be okay. What is a trade fixture? Children of the 80s know exactly what I just sang. Anybody born 1990 and after has no clue what I'm talking about. If you're born in the 70s, then you know exactly what that was. It's a little Gloria Estefan action in Miami Sound Machine. Back in big hair days. Okay, trade fixture is a fixture used for business purposes. Business purposes. Okay, trade fixture is a fixture used for business purposes. Is a trade fixture personal or real property? What do you guys think? Is it personal or real property? It is personal property because it goes with a person. And this is why I get so antsy when people say real property is immovable, personal property is movable. You guys just said a trade fixture is personal property and you gave the example of a dentist chair. I don't know about you, but any dentist chair I've seen, you're not moving. It's like bolted to the ground. Am I right or am I right? Okay, a dentist chair is bolted to the ground. So that's a great example of how personal property movable, real property immovable doesn't always apply. The better way to remember it is personal property goes with the person, real property goes with the real estate. And a dentist chair goes with the dentist when they leave that premise. Therefore, it's personal property. Everybody got it? So when they say personal property movable, think more in terms of when you move, when you leave, you take it with you. Not necessarily that if you could just kick it over or push it over. Everybody got that? It's a different way to think about it that may help you. Congratulations, Lou Hain, on passing the exam. What is the test for a fixture? What do you guys think? What is the test for a fixture? Who could tell me a test for a fixture? Not a trade fixture, just a normal fixture. What do you guys think? Maria. And Maria stands for method, adaptability, relationship, intention, and agreement. Method, adaptability, relationship, intention, and agreement. Maria. Method, adaptability, relationship, intention, and agreement. A fixture is a piece of personal property that is now considered real property because it's incorporated into the land. It's incorporated into the land. Incorporate it into the land. We have one more on the board, but before I do that last one, remember, if you guys want me just to give you the answers to the exam, you could send me money on PayPal, just, um, and I'll send you the answer. It's just something I do if people are struggling. I could use a little extra cash. Just send me an email at joe at stop cheating and start studying. What are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. Are you guys kidding? Who started like writing my email? How dare you guys? I'm so disappointed in you. Some of you guys are like, wait, Joe at start studying and stop cheating. Wait, what? Is that, is that a CH or how does that work? Okay. Some of you guys are like, wait, is he serious? How many of you guys, even though you knew it was ridiculous, were like, but just in case he's serious, I'm going to email him later today, just in case. There's no secret code there, nothing like that, okay? Nothing there. 
Okay, move right along. So funny, you guys probably tell your kids, don't ever cheat, study with honor. Learn for the sake of learning because it makes you a better human being. And then I say, here's the answer, like, cool, give it to me, I'm on it, awesome. And your kid's like, mom, what are you doing? Whatever, I need to pass. Do as I say, not as I do. Okay, last one, what is real property? What is real property? What is real property? Aaron, don't start that. I did not. Real property is, as we said, things that go with the real estate. Generally immovable. Not always, but generally immovable. Good. All right, guys, that's it for today. Adios, adios, a class A termino. Adios, adios, a class A termino. Adios, amigos, a class A termino. Adios, adios, a class A termino. All right, guys, thank you so much. It's been great, it's been a pleasure. And I will see you guys soon. This webinar will be available for you guys to watch as many times as you want. Thanks, guys. Bye.